Um, so thank you for Kat uh, for the introduction and uh, the structure of uh, tonight's program. Uh, before we go into the discussion, I'll actually let the three speakers uh, talk a bit about their respective research related to Pan Yuliang and also or, or their individual art practices uh, before we go into a group discussion. And uh, so the first ho half hour will be their presentations. And then we'll do the discussion and then open the floor to the audience for questions. Um, and so I think uh, first we'll begin with uh, Dr. Sandy Ng to present her uh, relevant research about Pai Yuliang first. So, yeah. Hello, um, I'm Sandy Ng, and I would like to thank Joyce and the Asia Society to invite me here to talk about Pai Yuliang. And um, you've seen the show, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, my interest in her work really stems from the fact that I'm interested in um, modern art, um, modern Chinese art, especially um, in the medium of oil. Um, my work concerns quite a bit about modernity and gender. So in this work, for instance, that you've seen in the exhibition, um, we see her basically presenting herself. And I always find that in her self-portraits, her expressions are really very strong. And in this case, um, it's very much foreground by um, the floral backgrounds um, that really projects her expression um, forward. And I also find that um, her sense of self here is um, embodied by her qi pao, so that's her cultural self. Um, and her essence, if I may call it that, is actually in the letter that she's holding that has her name on it. I think that probably is a letter from home, perhaps. In my research, I also talk about how artists um, fashion themselves, and that doesn't only reside in um, the artist's self-portrait. I think it's also in her other works as well. For instance, in this work that's also featured in um, the exhibition, we see actually a very strong presence of a female figures. And I think the robustness of the um, image, it's really in the tension that a pointer right here how the the gesture of her arms that's arranging her hair and also she's really good at that um leaving the background slightly void so the body actually projects forward actually making um the figure very sculptural and of course we mustn't forget that she was a sculptor so i think when she constructs figures whether it's herself or others she's always thinking about how to make them look real and i think this is a very successful presentation Now, this is probably a lady she knew, we, we don't know, or I don't know, um, but you also see a feminine self that she re a very strong feminine self that she projects in image like this. And I think there are several in this exhibition. Look at the way she gazed back at the painter at the time, and she gazed back at you. And I think when you see the paintings too, I mean, I was very struck by, I, I think I knew this before I um, saw many of her works in person, that she's a really great colorist. And in this work, she really construct much of the composition, especially her dress, through very strong and vigorous brush strokes of um, colors. So the work looks very rhythmic. It has a kind of musicality in it, and it makes the woman's presence really very strong. And the last work I have is this. Um, people often talk about Asian artists as those who borrow from the West and that their works are not very original. I tend not to actually see them that way. Um, I see Pang Yulong, for instance. I just call her a modern artist. And for me, a modern artist, it's someone who really knows how to observe life and also how to represent um, modern life. Like in this one, for instance, is dating. So she captures a very intimate moment of two people out on 
on a date, maybe the, for the first time or the second time. And you can see that it's very intimate because they're blushing. So she really emphasized that. And I'm also really struck by how the, the back of those two chairs are projected into our space, which re actually reminds me of um, the technique that Japanese woodblock print artists would use um, in terms of sort of breaking the division between our space and um, painterly space. And again, in this one too, the colors are really wonderful. The contrast between her bright red orange dress and the more subtle colors of um, the jacket. So these are just four examples I have. And I think in terms of her um, acute observation of light, I think there are many good examples in the exhibition of people just out and about in the city, children playing in the play playground, um, people in an interior space. And I think modern artists tend to be very good at that, showing us um, what we do in our daily life. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Sandy for her um, uh, initial insights uh, sharing with us about uh, Pan Yuliang's artwork. And then next, uh, maybe we can get Mia to share uh, her uh, research about Pan Yuliang and also um, more about the video that you guys were watching earlier, which is also a presentation of her art historical research that's about this artist. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thanks, Joyce. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Asia Society for inviting me um, and also um, a Catherine Dong for her very kind arrangement for me to um, come to Hong Kong and share my little video and uh, share my uh, Pan Yuliang research. So um, my name is Mie Yu and uh, Yu Miao in Chinese. Um, I live in Beijing. Um, so uh, I, sometimes I was introduced as an artist, especially at the screening occasions like today. But I'm mainly an art historian and a curator, uh, specialized in modern and Chinese contemporary art. Um, however, there's also part of my practice that is sort of um, hard to define. And the Pan Yuliang project is very much one of these kind of um, um, projects that is situated between the art historical research, the curatorial, and um, the artistic practice. So um, um, I, let me just say a few things why I made this a video. So two years ago, around this time, I was approached by uh, Villa Vassiliev, which is a contemporary art center in Paris, and also Guangdong Times Museum, to do an exhibition about Pan Yuliang. The curator is a very good friend of mine, Nikita Tsai, um, who has invited six contemporary artists to make contemporary work and in response to Pan Yuliang's life and work. Um, and I was brought to board. And um, Nikita and I had worked on projects um, before and we are very good friends. So we start to have a consensus right away. That is, forget about, you know, uh, the sort of a category I'm working on. Forget that I'm a curator or critic or, or artist. I can inhabit in all these roles and just really work beyond this, all these categories and see what kind of project can, can come out of this. Um, so um, I, I said yes to this exhibition right away, not because I had a lot of research on Pan Yuliang already, but because I've always been interested in women artists in early 20th century. Um, and there's also this lingering feeling or impression about the voice and the silence of the women artists of early 20th century. There has been a proliferation of women entering modern art academies and going to Europe and Japan to study oil painting. And once they returned to China in 1930s, they have been uh, promoted as this new generation of um, uh, women artists and, uh, and testimony to the um, nation's modernity. However, after 1937, um, their voice and also their participation to institutions sort of dwindled, um, maybe because of the outbreak of the war or... Um, I think the um, institutional structure of art academy uh, led by male leaders also played a role in 
a sort of a silencing of women's artists. So, um, and Pan Yuliang is one of the most famous women artists, and she is uh, she's someone that taxi drivers would know in China. However, um, she's also quite anonymous in a way that when you look at all these writings about her on the internet, uh, she was kind of framed the same way. And the cliches just go on and on um, uh, forever. And there's a hardly any new light shed on her. So I was very interested in pursuing this project, but I faced a, a big challenge. That is, um, I have no way to see her works. Uh, most of her, her works um, in the collection of Anhui Museum, and the Anhui Museum is under renovation, and uh, you know she's just not being exhibited in China. So um, instead, I went to visit various archives and um, museum collections, and also historical sites in France and in Paris. Although not seeing her a lot of her works, but I've been trying to find the traces she left in all these sites. So um, my uh, journey started in Paris. Um, I just go like this. OK, so I start with this image, this man. Um, his name is Marc Vaux. Um, he's a French photographer living in the center of um, uh, Montparnasse in Paris. And she owned a professional uh, photo, uh, photo studio. So from 1920s until 1960s, uh, he photographed um, 200, he made 200,000 photographs of artists active in Pompidou, uh, sorry, in Montparnasse. And after he died, he donated all, his, his family donated all his um, uh, glass plate negatives to Santa Pompidou. And Pompidou started to um, categorize these um, photo archives and made into three parts. Uh, the first pass is actually a uh, master, uh, Picasso or um, Matisse. And the second category consists of artists in Pompidou collection. And the third category is called anonymous. And these are the artists from China, from Japan, from Egypt, from Latin America. And often they, this, their names were spelled wrong and they're put in the wrong label. Um, so. And this uh, the anonymous category just sit in the archive of Pompidou for many years until recently is sort of driven by this drive to decenter modernism. And Pompidou start to look at all these anonymous artists and turn out they are the artists very important in national art history, um, um, like Sang Yu, like Pan, uh, Pan Yuliang, they're all in this category. So, and this is also the reason why uh, Villa Vassiliev, this art institution in Paris, approached us to do exhibition about Pan Yuliang. So, okay. So the first um, site I visited is the um, National Art History Library in Paris. Um, Pan Yuliang's uh, archive was contained in this small box. Um, the materials are mainly about her last exhibition in Paris in 1977. Um, this is the very the last show she did before she passed away. So I didn't find many things, just a few photographs and some exhibition um, um, memos. And this is um, the second site I, I went to, the L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, the National Art Academy in Paris. Um, and this uh, book you're looking at is actually the student reg registration. It contains all the names and records of um, students in painting and sculpture department from 1894 to 1925. And on the, on the um, spine, you can see two uh, French words. Um, maybe you can now see clearly, élève homme, which means male students. So although um, the L'École des Beaux-Arts started to accept female students from 19... Uh, 10, um, but only male students were recorded in the, in the official record. And um, in this book, I found, can you see the, uh, the fourth um, line? Uh, Do you know who that is? Xu Beihou. 
Yeah, so this is how um, his name was um, uh, translated, Yu Beiyong. And also Chang Shu Hong, uh, who is an, another Chinese artist who studied, very important one, studied at the Lake Hodo Bazaar. And of course, I cannot find Pan Yuliang. Uh, she studied in the studio of, of Lucien Simon, but um, she didn't pass the official exam. So she was not a kind of official student. She was considered as an atelier student. And why she didn't even pursue the exam. So I asked the question um, many times. And uh, it seems to me that due to the anti-Semitic uh, act uh, in the early 20th century, the Le Code de um, stopped granting certificate, a graduation certificate to uh, foreign students. So Pan Yuliang, as a, someone coming from low origin who um, was planning to teach back in China, she really needed that paper, that certificate. So for that reason, I guess she, that's why she didn't really pursue um, an official, being an official student. And instead, she managed to go to study in Rome. And she's one of, probably one of the five students during Republican era graduated from the Rome uh, Academy of Fine Arts. And the, um, the material, archival materials is still very hard to obtain, but it is in Rome where she obtained most of her formal training. Um, so I couldn't find much material in this um, institution, so instead I went to the Paris police. And Paris police has a really amazing archives um, about all the foreigners living in the 20s and up until 70s. And uh, Eric Lefebvre, the, the curator of the, uh, this show, um, suggested me to go because that's when, when he researched um, the address of artists, that's the place uh, he goes. So I went to the police archive, I ended up finding a lot of material about Pan Yuliang. Um, but these are not materials about her as an artist, but uh, these are the police surveillance uh, archive. So it turns out the police kept a close eye on her uh, in the 1950s. This is before China and France um, established um, a formal diplomatic relationship. And the police are still trying to figure out, um, um, is she a communist or is she a nationalist? She often hosts um, artist parties in her home, and she was also a leader of Chinese Artists Association. So what are these Chinese people talking about? So the... Uh, when I translate these um, documents, and it's really quite amusing. It starts from a uh, very sort of objective observation of who she is and date of birth. When she arrived in France, she studied with Lucien Simon at the Lico de Boza. And then um, the following paragraph is a, a profile of Chinese artists. Uh, certain artists like to marry French women, and, and they like to hang out in certain cafe. Some Chinese artists, um, they don't talk to French people. They stayed in a different cafe. Uh, a very detailed documentation of um, the daily activities of Chinese artists. And then at one paragraph, um, this officer just suddenly had um, very subjective uh, comments. Um, oh, all these artists, all these Chinese people, they are smiley on the appearance, but never, they should never be trusted. And then uh, he moved on to another objective paragraph. So, you know, all this, um, um, so I like to imagine there is a real human being. You know, these uh, dot records are not written by robots, but by real observing human beings. Um, and it shows kind of, um, um, uh, well, racism and also um, um, many aspects of distrust, not just on artists, but also uh, foreigners in general. So honestly, I didn't find that much about Pan Yuliang. Um, the, the, scar the scarcity of her as artist, um, documents her as artist in French institution is really um, in a striking contrast against the, the proliferation of the police um, archive. And then my journey brought me back to Hefei. This is where her, all her paintings, um, all her personal belongings um, um, are in this museum, uh, Anhui Provincial Museum. So she died in 1977, and in 1981, 
um, all her paintings and, and, and stuff basically were put in uh, on the eight boxes and shipped back to China. And when her stuff arrived in Shanghai, um, it stayed there for a month because nobody knows where her stuff should go. Um, she's in a crack between, you know, Western modern art canon and uh, she and the national art history. So this person or this artist literally did not really exist in the history of New China. Um, and then Kafa, Center Academy of Fine Art, came from Beijing and picked two or three paintings by Sang Yu. Uh, national Art Gallery came and picked three of her portraits and some uh, paintings of a Parisian street scene. And for the, the majority of all this stuff, you know, what do we do with them? So the, the, the chairman of the uh, artist, um, National Artist Association, Wu Zuoren, um, asked one question, where is her husband from? And uh, her husband is from Anhui province. So let's bring all the stuff to Hefei, to Anhui Museum. So this is how all her paintings end up in Hefei. Um, I think, you know, without Han Yuliang, probably I will never pay a visit to <laughs> Anhui Museum. But um, I went with the other artists and the curator. Um, it's a, it's a, a bureaucratic state museum, uh, and the experience of gaining access was um, uh, horrendous. However, it is in this museum I had the most powerful experience with her, with Pan Yuliang, I would say. So uh, we were um, led by the museum staff to wait, um, you know, her material to arrive in this um, uh, room. And we sit around this table and there's a plastic foam on the table. And we were sitting there for half an hour staring at this foam, waiting for the, uh, the, the things to arrive. And it's really like we start to participate in the ritual of calling for spirit. Um, and then when the staff came, the, the things... Uh, they brought out was sort of not in um, a rational order. I think that the museum didn't really had a lot of um, um, institutional intervention in terms of classifying her um, her uh, personal belongings. So it was it was what is wonderful in a way that it was still in the original state of this messiness. So the staff sort of just pour all of this materials and the objects to the table, and the first thing I picked up is the uh, photo album. Yeah, do you think we could kind of fly through the Hefei pictures yes. and then uh, move on to the, the Yu Yangli sure, ones? Sure, which are sure. Really so some of the pictures think, that you yeah. already saw at the, um, the exhibition, uh, there are some, and I was very interested in not just the, the photos, but also the materiality of, um, of the photos and how they are arranged. And these are the, um, uh, the personal letters. And there's a one letter I will talk about later, which lead me to a visit to Shanghai, Yu Yangli. And this is the photo I chose uh, to put in the film. Because uh, all these photos, uh, as they are in a personal photo album, they are not really categorized. So for me, it's like a constellation of life moments. And this is her uh, cookie jar, you know, containing her um, tools. And so this is the the last moment in the museum when the elevator opened, they wrote her painting out. And this is the moment like she suddenly appeared uh, in front of us and Pan Yuliang is there. And this is a moment that give us the goosebumps uh, and we hover down to look at this painting. Um, but we, we feel, at least for me, she is behind this thin veil of fog. I couldn't really figure out who she is. But this moment of her presence was so strong. Um, and I think as art historian, when we go to somebody's personal archive, uh, we have all experienced this moments of you feel the specter, specter of the artist is there. But this feeling of being haunted, you cannot um, really put in academic paper. And I think this is um, when, why we need an art project. Okay, so um, I just want to mention one letter I saw at the Hefei Museum is um, um, 
Pai Yuliang was in her 60s and her husband was in, her, in his 70s. The husband wrote a letter to her in Paris and saying, remember uh, back in 1920 when we were in Shanghai, you did something against my will. You brought my first wife from the countryside to Shanghai and uh, asked me to live with her and you um, lived in the attic. Um, and uh, one year later, um, my wife had a son, and this is when you went back, you went to study in Paris. So um, because of you, we have our family has a son. So this, this letter really struck me as um, something paradoxical. Uh, we consider her as a new woman. Uh, however, there's all this uh, sort of feudal idea of inviting the first wife and providing um, a son, producing a son, and... Um, so this letter stayed with me for a long time, and uh, it also made me really want to visit her old home in Shanghai. So the, here I went, and it's in the area called the Yuyang Li, Yuyang Alley, in the very commercial area of Shanghai. Um, however, you see, this is um, the the alley was still very much preserved in the original state. Uh, you go in, and it's this sort of in this archaic, archaic um, um, alley. Um, it consists of a parallel lanes, three, two or three lanes. The first lane is not where Pan Yuliang used to live, but it's very, um, you know, kind of renovated. And I went to the first lane, and I found that this is where the memorial for Chinese Communist Youth League is. Uh, there is a huge museum. Um, it turns out in 1920, when Pan Yuliang and, his, and her wife and her husband first arrived in this um, area, in this neighborhood, there's another group of um, um, Chinese communist youth also arrive in the same alley. And they were um, translating Chinese, um, translating communist communique. Um, and the, the site where they were doing their translation was turned into a museum to commemorate the founding of Communist Youth League. And all these men on the, on the wall, they were the, um, the people were translating. Um, so right behind this lane is where uh, Chen Duxiu founded New Youth Journal. Chen Duxiu was one of the founders of a communist party. So I went to the parallel lane, which is um, where um, Pan Yutiang used to live. And this lane was not as um, renovated as the other one. And I found her, this is her old house. So I opened the house. Um, I talked to the owner. And the owner showed me this attic. And this is um, uh, in the letter, the husband talked about um, Pan Yutiang living in the attic and letting the main um, um, bedroom to the husband and, um, and the first wife. So this is a Pan Yuliang in 1932, after she returned from Paris, uh, she painted this amazing painting called My Family. And this little boy in the middle is the, the son of, uh, of the first wife. So there is something very um, seemingly paradoxical and contradictory about um, the new woman. Um, however, perhaps, perhaps this, is the only, this is also her way to sort of freeing her to pursue her study in France, but um, um, with um, already a son in the family. Um, so from Yuyang Alley, I went to another site, is um, Shanghai Art Academy, where Pan Yuliang also studied uh, in 1920. Uh, the photo on the left is the photo taken in 1925, and this is the current state now. It's quite dilapidated. A lot of families live in this building. Um, so I went to this site um, just to see the, um, the classroom. Uh, this is the classroom, the first photo. Now it's someone's kitchen, it's a communal kitchen. But uh, uh, back in the 20s, it was um, um, a painting, it was a studio for um, Western painting department with very high ceiling and skylight. Um, I came to the site also looking for a steely, because when I reading the archive, um, there was somebody remembered 
at the Shanghai Art Academy, the year when Pan Yuliang was admitted as one of the first female students, they um, also made a stele to, com to commemorate this event. And the stele was sort of, um, sort of built or buried into part of the uh, architecture. Uh, hidden inside, and then a few years ago, when the uh, when they were renovating the building, um, the stele kind of uh, came out from the wall. Um, so I couldn't find any other records about what's written on the stele, and that's why I went to talk to this old man, and he certainly remember the event when the stele was found in the wall. So I asked him, um, "Are there any names on the stele? Is Pan Yuliang one of the names?" And he said, "You know." It was quite heavily eroded. They couldn't see any writing. However, uh, the only thing you can see are the four seal characters engraved on the top of the stele. And uh, it, go, it says um, um, birth marking on the slushy snow. And uh, I said, why? Why birth marking on the slushy snow? And I, I realized this is a quotation from Su Shi's poem uh, to... Um, is something about life is transient and youth is transient. Um, life is just like birth marking left on the slushy snow. Um, and, um, and from that moment, I decided to, to do a film using all these archival materials I found in Paris and in, in China. Because for me, all these archival fragments, they are like birth marking on the snow, the bird has flown off. And what uh, we were left are text, image, sound, uh, artworks, and our imaginations. And from all these birth markings uh, scattered all over the world, maybe I can construct a geography um, of a, a woman's journey. Um, and um, so the next image is after the exhibition, I went to Paris. I put um, the exhibition catalog on her grave. And as I took this photo, uh, the wind blow open the cover page. And the first, this image shown, and this is the image when um, she was rolled out of the elevator at the Hefei Museum. And this is as if um, Han Yuliang heard my calling. So thank you very much. Oh. Uh, so thank you for, to Mia for sharing her very interesting uh, research on Pan Yuliang. And I'd also like to get uh, Celia to share a bit about uh, her own uh, art practice as an artist who uh, is from Hong Kong, but uh, she's had fine arts training in Southern California. And her practice um, is a lot of, is very often an autobiographical search uh, for cultural and aesthetic identity. So it would be great if you could talk a bit about that too. Thank you. First, um, thank you for inviting inviting me. I'm very honored. Um, and after listening to Mia's really touching and poetic ending, I feel that what I'm going to show is kind of out of place. But uh, <laughs> it all fits together <laughs> because it's later. like you know, it's going to be about me. But um, but I kind of think that well, the, one of the reasons why you guys have me is because um, as a painter, uh, well, female painter. Um, and uh, I've carefully looked at um, uh, Pan's uh, work, um, and I find it very naturally, uh, I can very naturally relate to her work or our paths. Um, I think in a way it's quite, um, I mean, it's what Mia was talking about, the search, uh, it's on a very human, uh, personal base. Um, of trying to find a real person, who she is, and she what she has done, what she had gone through, and how how um, unfortunately at the end it seems like she was trapped. Sort of after she died, she was sort of trapped. Even her work was tra tra kind of trapped between um, you know a Western art category or Chinese art category or where she's going to to be housed. Like her work would be housed. So I, but then I just want to, as an artist or as a painter, I look at her work and I can respond to her work maybe through some of my work. I think it's quite normal for people who actually have a very strong Chinese cultural um, um, 
uh, I I would it, it's hard to say just to say it's an identity, but because um, when I was a kid, I I was a reader of Chinese literature uh, at a very young age. I love reading Chinese history. And for some reason, I thought that was my Chinese identity in a way because I relate to those things so deeply and I, I loved it. And, um, and so uh, I think I had a sort of uh, imagined identity of being Chinese because growing up in Hong Kong, I think that's more an imagined identity of Chinese and an imagined identity of Chinese culture more than is really a Chinese culture from like, say, if I live in China. Right, uh, because it's a very different type of culture. Actually, there's a definitely uh, distinctively distinctive difference between uh, a Hong Kong Chinese and somebody who uh, grew up in mainland China. But because of all these Chinese studies that I had in my earlier life, then I imagined or I relate deeply to say some of the old poets. Like I feel so relate to uh, Sosek, for example, Sosek in Mandarin. <laughs> sushi, I think. Um, you know, the song poet. Um, uh, sushi. Sushi. Sorry. And so, um, for example, I relate to that very much. I was like so into Chinese history. I was major in Chinese history when I was in high school. But then my whole family moved to America. And uh, well, we're quite lucky that we settled in Southern California. Um, so in a way, uh, the, the diversity of the community, it's actually quite exciting, you know, being a student, um, a young person uh, landed in a place of diversity, basically cultural diversity, and um, it's very stimulating, very exciting, and also you feel that you are so part of that pluralism uh, of an American society, uh, particularly in a more, uh, we we'll say, a more blue, blue state, you know, like more... Um, a uh, 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 democratic atmosphere and certainly you know I was very lucky I, I landed in Santa Monica College so it's even more of you know it's a kind of like crazy uh, uh, fourth runner of um, being liberals so to speak right uh, but then I guess um, as everybody who went, gone through this uh, kind of identity thing is like you have a set of um, you have a certain nature that you 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 sort of born with. Uh, it's hard to explain how it happened, but then I just deeply relate to it. You know, my my Chinese or slash Cantonese culture. Um, and at the same time, when I first started studying, um, I realized that oh, it's such an amazing thing that painting. Because I have this also at the same time a deep desire for painting. I love portraits, I've, I love, you know, I, I just love all these uh, things that Western art can do since I was young. So it's kind of a funny way growing up because I had some big picture books of uh, the Western masters. I don't know why my dad pretty much bought those things for me when I was like 12 or even younger. Um, so I, I didn't quite know what they are, but I know I love them. I mean, I remember I loved Velasquez's paintings of um, the princesses, I, the infantas. I love, you know, the Michelangelo's things. I love the Goya stuff. I mean, I, I got really scared, freaked out when I was like, you know, 12 looking at the Goya stuff, but then love it at the same time. And I didn't quite understand. But then there's this deep desire that I love painting people. I love looking at people. So that is actually, you know, another side of me. So when I go to um, art school, actually, you want to go to college, I was just so overjoyed that I had a chance reading China, um, uh, art history, you know. And at the same time, when you start painting, you realize that, oh my God, you know, when I paint, I actually need to understand this whole thing. Painting, for me, is actually pretty much the whole thing about Western culture. It's the cream of Western culture, honestly. I mean, at least for me. Um, so I need to I need to know about it. And then, but then at the same time, I live in a very very, um, you know, as I said, very liberal place. That everybody was searching for their identity. I had great uh, influence, even from my friends who are Mexicans, who have gr strong, strong, strong identity um, uh, 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 sense. Who painted so much from drawing from their own culture. And then I started thinking, 
what am I, you know, there's a serious impact uh, happening. You know, there's a cultural clashes. It clashes because um, on one hand, I have certain nature that I cannot deny, which, you know, I relate to certain Chinese things that I cannot deny. And you will see. And then at the same time, I also relate to, I also have this great desire to paint oil paintings. And I have this great desire to paint people. So it took me quite a long time to, you know, it's a pretty much a self-search thing. And also I think the art thing is very much to find your own aesthetic identity than, you know, you know, who you are. So therefore you do certain things and it doesn't have to be directly, you know, just because you happen to be Chinese and so you just kind of go for it. Uh, what you would have to at a certain time during a certain period, and then you just have to navigate it and figure out, um, you know, what you can do. So um, I would have to thank your patience uh, first, because it's kind of like a crazy montage of <laughs> paintings that I put together. Um, so I just kind of, should I just go forward? Um, so these are very old paintings. Actually, it's kind of embarrassing. They are very old. Um, it kind of, you know, uh, you see that actually um, these are some of the early drawings that I have, the left side. I mean, like they were kind of related to desire, sexuality stuff. Um, everybody thought those are sperms. They're not. They're actually snakes. There's one of those things about snakes, um, you know, and a lot of symbolism from the East and West. Uh, from the East, actually, snakes are always about, uh, you know, um, fertility, you know, it's about uh, life, you know, snake is a good thing, you know, in, in the Eastern culture or in Chinese culture. But um, in a Western culture, it's always the temptation, the devil, the whatever. So for me, that's very interesting. I always found it very interesting that the symbolism, how they cross uh, paths and how you see them as or maybe they are just about desire, or maybe they have something to do with, they're just swimming happily in this void, in these very dark areas. And in my, in my earlier works, I always love very dark things. So um, the left ones is called He and I. The left, uh, the diptych, actually, uh, you see a lot of snake stuff going on. Um, and the heart, La Corazon, because of course I was very much, you know, uh, influenced by my beloved Mexican friend and the heart, the sacred heart. And of course, I'm always fascinated by the Catholics also, because I think, you know, without the Catholic, without Catholicism, there's no Western art. So <laughs> at least for painting. So, um, so those things for me are very, very important. And uh, the background actually, um, I think you can see it because it's so dark. Uh, that little stream thingy there um, actually has something to do with the Mona Lisa background. Um, if you know the painting of Mona Lisa, in the back there is like a landscape. And that landscape fascinated me all the time uh, since I was little. So I decided to create that sort of, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, here. So uh, that that sort of very ambiguous dark thing in the back, it supposedly is back is the is the landscape. So so there's reference definitely about that. Um, so these are um, I think they're pastel on wrapping paper and pastel uh, and acrylic on wrapping paper. These are large. Uh, brown wrapping paper uh, or one is I think these are actually the colors are kind of funny right now because some of them were green wrapping paper the waxy ones and they're actually quite long they're like eight feet long so it's like maybe 2.5 or 2.6 meter high so they're actually very long uh, weird things so that was very early. And then I had my first solo exhibition. And um, so the Lotus, the first, the top one, as you can see, you know, the Lotus thing. Um, uh, the, 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 this, is, this one is called Flotation, I think. There are like two Flotations. This is one of them. Um, this one is called Self. This is a triptych and it's actually very tall. Um, I think it's like maybe a little bit under three meters tall and one meter wide each 
And I think uh, I was greatly inspired by Zhang Daqian at the time. I saw an exhibition by him, and he is so famous with lotus paintings. And I related, I relate to it so deeply. And I, but then I know I'm not a Chinese painter. I, I'm never a Chinese painter, honestly. But I relate to ink. Uh, very much. I feel ink is a very na natural thing for me. It's just very natural. Actually, I think water-based paint, paint comes to me very naturally before oils. And that's why I think when I look at uh, used work, uh, Penn's work, um, I feel that I can see how she feel about, you know, the brushwork. Um, but also I think there's something very interesting about her work in the sense that um, because the Impressionists were very much, you know, uh, influenced by the Japanese print and by the Japanese uh, brushwork and flatness and flat colors. I think by the time she went to uh, Paris, she already have a very good base to kind of, you know, it, it's sort of like the Western art regurgitated it for her, you know, like they already, the Impressionists already did it so that she actually can receive something that has the, the, the Asian... Uh, element in it, you know, the brushwork, um, the the paint, the the flatness. Um, so I kind of relate to that. I kind of when I look at her work, I kind of think I I think you were, you know, looking at those things and um, and quite naturally it comes to you. And so um, I don't know. Am I making any sense to you? <laughs> Good. So um, so so I think that's something you cannot avoid. I mean, like if you if you have these kind of cultural background and it's very much in your blood. It's not like you want to shake it away because it's just come naturally. I think for her as a artist of the 20th century, early 20th century, it's actually even more natural for her because at the time people used a uh, brush naturally, you know, like instead of just pencil or pens, like, you know, the actual writing materials is already brush. It's still, they use a lot of Chinese brushes, writing, for writing. So I think for her, it's even more natural, you know, using the brushes than, like, you know, for her, as her, part of her expressions. So these things kind of, my things sort of kind of evolve. Um, so I was, like, very much um, influenced. I mean, I, I was just inspired by some of Zhang's uh, lotus. So these are some little experiments I have um, with, about the space and form. Uh, in a different way of understanding it. And later I developed something even more uh, ambiguous, but um, also kind of free form, flowing. Um, uh, and I guess like, you know, if you look at all the work, whether it's a Western, Western, whether it's a female artist or male artist, I think sexuality is always one thing. It's, it's, the, it's, it's already embedded in it. You know, it's about, f because sexuality is about life. It's about force. It's about how things are within you as the being. So I think that pretty much is, you know, kind of the earlier, um, uh, um, sort of very uh, uh, instinctive, mm -hmm. more. And Do I would think, think that also because it was just go through yeah. mo uh, slightly more quickly because I'm quite yeah, yeah, conscious yeah, sure. of time. So, yeah. um, so I just use these slides to respond sort of to the cell portraits, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think this is, I have, I have another one, not this one, right? You've, have you used a new one or this is still the old slides? Because anyway, so um, this is the, a few cell portraits of different period that I did. Um, I think the first one, this one is the oldest. I was still a student um, at Long Beach. I was very, but I actually, uh, you know, this is like one of those things that we do in class, uh, not in class, before the class, but uh, we did a lot of self-portraits naturally because you have no model. So I think one of the things that uh, for uh, Penn to do self-portraits also, I think she just pretty much dressed up herself to, to model for herself is a very natural thing to do. It's just like, you know, you want to use yourself to study and to discover what you can do or what's, what are the possibilities to portray a person. You know, it's like self-observation. So I did this one and then this one, uh, very different, um, much later. And, uh, and then this one I did when I was very sick, this one. I think I had a fever that night. So I thought, you know, just... Did. I, I remember this one was done very quickly in three hours. 
Um, so again, I just, these are more uh, quick paintings, actually. These, these three are more quick paintings, whereas this one um, is more of a, a more thorough study. I decided that I want to paint the surroundings as well. I want to paint the reflection and I want my paintings uh, to surround me. That's, these are my paintings. And all my objects, uh, my still lifes, my brush, and the reflection of my studio, that's the reflection of the light and the aircon um, and the ceiling. So that's pretty much what I am in, you know, studying myself in my studio. So that's, I, I found that I just want to respond to, um, you know, like everybody does uh, self portraits like, you know, Rembrandt did it or whatever, everybody kind of, you know, when you are painting people, if you're interested in painting people, I think that's actually quite a natural choice of, you know, self-study. I'm never very much into painting myself. I sometimes want to paint myself because I think maybe uh, I just want to study so certain things. I think, um, but lately I think maybe I should do another self-portrait uh, as a record of uh, growing into different age. So um, that's part of the intention, I think. Um, and it's a very, I, I think that's a very Western thing to do. There's a very Western art thing to do, actually. Uh, if you are, are in the Western um, art education, I think. Uh, particularly if you like painting people. I mean, that's one of the things. So I go to the Offshore Damo uh, exhibition. Um, so these are just some examples, more people, portrait, portrait. Uh, these, these portraits vary, the sizes are very different. Actually this one and this one, both are much larger paintings. Uh, I used to call them double bed size because it's four by six feet. So, and this is a, uh, a pastel drawing, actually. This is not a painting, this is a pastel drawing. On, again, you see the green paper, the wax paper. And, uh, and this is a very tiny, tiny um, uh, portrait on paper as well. I, I tend to quite like uh, portraits on paper. Activities in the studio, again, so these are very small paintings. They're all quite small paintings. These are activities uh, in the studio of the friends, of my friends. So this guy just stare at him. He comes in. Um, somebody is doing me a post of Saturday night, uh, Saturday fever, Saturday night fever, you know, the BGs thing. And then um, this one actually is a friend, is the same person. She was actually holding a bunch of uh, linen. She was a nude, but I decided to call it the muse and the artist uh, because I found it quite funny that, you know, uh, my, my partner is doing his painting while somebody's standing there. And I think it's quite a fun idea to do that. And so it's pretty much activity. This is like a tea party. And then the last one is the, is some, it's like three, three friends at a Shahani's restaurant. So being an nerd, painting nerd. So these are the kind of thing that I always got very excited about. The actual painting, the actual, um, the actual uh, activity of painting, you know, the, the act of painting. Um, so I have to jump to something. I just try to get it really fast and not to bombard you guys so much. Um, but this actually is one of those things that respond to my earlier desire of uh, my Chinese and my personal history. Um, I did several things. I did my wearable. Um, this is actually a collar here. This is a collar. The collar is a response. The style of this collar actually responds to a early 20th century uh, style, which goes all the way up to your face. Um, I think it's called Xiu Feng Xian Ling. Xiao Xiao Feng Xian Ling. Okay. So. Um, and that's what I was thinking about. Of course, this is an exaggerated uh, version of it. That's actually a black and white photo of me and my brother when we were little in front of a black and white photo of Kowloon in, uh, I think it was Ocean Terminal in Chim Sachoy. So this has something to do with my, this actually all these wearables, I did three, well, I, I did a bunch of wearables, but the major ones, there were three of them and they were all, uh, about something. Um, and I never wanted very much pin, there was like an idea of what they are and I 
well, I can tell you later because I just don't want to. Yeah. But I never really just pinpoint what they exactly are in a way that I want them to, I want them to suggest, I want the details to suggest you a certain idea you can imagine about. And yes, they are related to Hong Kong. They're related to early Hong Kong life. They're related to my life. They're related to say, for example, this little thing actually is a picture of Wan Chai in the 1930s. And you have a uh, Lu Shun's uh, uh, approach here, I think. So there are a lot of cultural uh, cultural elements in my piece. There are like lots of cultural elements in my piece, actually. And wordplay, I think, that one. Um, this one actually is a Mexican skull, uh, sugar skull for the Day of the Dead, my friend gave me. But then it also says something, and that's from the Zhu uh, Zi, you know, Zhu uh, Hei. Uh, they they also have certain like there's a teaching in the Tongsheng right the Chinese calendar about so I I pretty much just crop out the words um, and I found it very interesting because the way you read it from left side or you read it from the right side means quite differently so it could be somebody famous from the east or you hear somebody from the east coming from the East. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of thing that I was very interested in. I had done quite some of these um, wearables and later on I realized that I was just commenting on history of, of my understanding of my culture, right? The, the, the little things that I did, which um, actually you can see them in the website. Uh, anyway, so um, that's my grandmother. Uh, that's from uh, my uh, show, uh, That Moment Now. And it's actually a seven by eight feet tall face. Uh, actually, there's another one of my grandfather, which I didn't in include here. Um, so this thing, this very important piece for me, because, you know, I was, uh, it was, it was about, it was about her and her storytelling, actually, that show. Um, and it's very much about memory, of how we think about memory. So that so this one is related to what is going on here. This is actually a later response to that show, my own response. Uh, this is called Created Memory uh, in a very big shape of a commercial uh, a vessel, a commercial ship, very big shape, if you can relate to that. Um, so there are images of painted images or photograph images of places, certain places that has to do with my grandparents' uh, roots, uh, family uh, portraits, uh, lacquer objects that I have certain reason to put in there. Um, so this is very uh, autobiography biography kind of respond to that and uh, because my grandmother actually uh, was a third generation local Hong Kong, uh, which my father's side, I'm the first generation Hong Kong. But on my mother's side, I'm the she's third, four, fifth generation local Hong Kong. So it's very interesting in that sense that, you know, how I feel my roots. Uh, so later on, I cannot help it, but I respond to my very strong desire of painting people. And... Uh, this is a series that I'm still ongoing developing. I still have two pieces I haven't finished, uh, but uh, they are nevertheless something I strongly relate to because of my deep love for um, all the great masters' work. Uh, and these are fragments, like these three, this one, this one, and this one. They are details. Uh, these two actually belongs to one long scroll, um, and these two only are details of one long scroll. And it's the same three people who are my friends. Um, uh, who uh, And then uh, this is from another painting. This is a segment from another painting of the same series. And the fact that you look at this looking, the, the, the image look like this is not because it's out of focus, but it's painted in a way that it, lo it looks like it's out of focus. So it's actually, this is a clear slide. This is not a... Uh, out of focus slide. I have to make that clear because I kind of feel people would think it's just a bad slide. It's not. Uh, same thing happened with this one. So it's about the presence. I think for me, the Western art thing is always about the presence of person. I mean, the portrait is not really portrait, but it's really about the presence of who these people are. 
So for me, that's always the most important thing, the existence of people. So when, so I want to respond to um, Penn's work, as uh, Mia was talking about her existence, like when she comes into, when her painting comes into um, the room, you feel her presence. I mean, that's what it is all about. I think all the portraiture is not really, people think that, oh, you just paint them and it look like them, but it's not really the likeness only. The likeness is definitely there. If it's a good portrait, it's definitely there. However, I think it's the presence, like they really are there, they stand there and they live and you feel them exist uh, uh, because of this work rather than, oh, who they are, just why they're, like just the stories, but they should, like when I, like I said this many times, some of you already knew that, um, like I always look at Velasquez paintings and I thought, my God, this person stood there, stands there, still standing there for nearly 500 years staring at you. And that presence is always there. It's not like that's just a painting of somebody from that era. It's not about that. When you look at a work, a true art, a true piece of art, it is the represent. It is not just a representation. It is, it is, it is the being. So therefore the being that that I always got very moved by these things. I go to the museum and I just got really moved when you see a really great painting and you really see that person and you really see that painting become the being and you don't remember it's a painting. And that kind of thing Can is I very... Can just add yeah. a bit? Um, it's very interesting you talk about that because the moment I talk about in the Anhui Museum, um, um, when you look at that portrait, you feel that she's there and yet she's not there. Um, is this... The portrait is in between the presence and not being there, oh, and yeah. that and that draws you to long for her um, presence. Where yeah, is she? Yeah, of course, and who because she is. you and, understand yeah, it's a painting. Powerful. I think the the most amazing thing about painting is that at the same time you truly understand. You see the pigment, you see the brush strokes, mm -hmm. you see how it's done, you see the tactile quality of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the beauty about it. I mean, that's what art is about, right? Like you do know what it is, but then this paradoxical, crazy, messing up your mind thing is telling you at the same time, this is a painting, but oh my God, it's a being. So that kind of thing really, you know, it, it's it's truly amazing. So I think the yeah. conversation has kind of naturally started already. So um, uh, the last one, I just quickly just want to go through. And so I, what I do right now is just really, you know, uh, I paint even more people. And the 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 lower one, the upper one is um, a dear friend's family portrait that I did for him, which I'm very proud of. Um, the one on the right side, right bottom, is my parents. I recreate I recreate uh, my parents' uh, youth. Actually, they were from different images, but I kind of like forced them together and painted them together with the color. And the left side, the the, the still life, is what I'm taken right now I'm very much taken by the act of painting and I think uh you know some about and 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 I don't see them contradicting or being different than anything else that I'm doing um because they're all part of me and I think they're all doing the right thing for me as an artist and the western or eastern idea I think it's f already fused in um in my work so I don't quite now I'm at a stage that I don't quite worry about it anymore, but I respond to, I, I use this to respond to um, Penn's work because I feel that very strongly about her, that as a painter, uh, unless you're only drawn to your calling as a woman, otherwise as a painter, you look at her work, you know she's truly interested in art and aesthetics. And that's her, that's her thing, you know, that's her, that's her real thing. So. What, you, what she did was really about searching the right aesthetic, searching the right way to paint for her. Not right way, but searching her own way to paint. So all this cultural impact, you know, she was looking at Matisse, she was definitely looking at, at Gauguin, she was definitely looking at uh, Degas. I think the one that you were using, the bath, I think that was a very, very Degas um, uh, response from her to, you know, the, the bather. Um, so I think it's just definitely you see, you know, a very active 
uh, observation of what the masters at the time, the contemporary art masters for her at the time is the, the modern masters, what they're doing and what they're dealing with and so how she respond to it and how she can make use of it. And so I, when I look at the show, that's how it feels for me. That's how it feels, you know, what as an artist, what she's trying to nurture herself with all these things that she, she, she has come across, which is very exciting for her. So that's, thank you, I shut up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks. I think uh, that actually what you were saying feeds quite nicely into the first question that I had planned, but I'm quite conscious that we're already over time. So I think I'll just ask my question and then we'll see how it goes. And then I still want to give the audience a chance to ask any questions that have come up. And I think uh, tonight's discussion was really uh, supposed to be about how uh, the, all the different uh, angles and frameworks and narratives we might use to understand Pan Yuliang and her art. And I think in the uh, presentations by the three speakers, a lot of these different uh, frameworks and narratives have already been um, uh, highlighted. And so the, the first question that I had and I think this is something that um, all three of you have touched upon is the East meets West narrative you know blending of Chinese and Western aesthetics is definitely uh, a framework that's most commonly used to understand Pai Yuliang and her work and I think um, just now uh, in in Mia's video uh, there's a bit where you say uh, you you actually think that she's in this awkward position of being between uh, the Orient and the Occident and between these two different cultural aesthetics and maybe to artists or audiences now, you know, blending of East and West is no longer such a new thing. And indeed, it could even be a cliche, as you said, just now a word that you use. Um, there are a lot of cliches that uh, people use to describe uh, Pai Yuliang and her life and her art. So I just wanted to ask um, whether you think there's still a, a great significance towards using this framework of the East and West to understand and position Pai Yuliang and her art, uh, or whether you see this as possibly like a reductive approach. And I think Sandy in your research about hybrid modernism, it definitely touches a, a lot about this. So maybe you can start, um, yeah. So um, for me, I think it is reductive to continue nowadays to talk about um, Asian artists as sort of just blending of East and West or they are hybrid pro um, product. Um, because you can also say that about European artists, any European artists who um, borrowed from non-Western culture. We know, for instance, Picasso was very much inspired by African art, but we don't tend to talk about him as someone borrowing from the East. Um, we often would say he was inspired. So there is that sort of um, unfairness when we talk about Asian artists in that context, um, which is why I try not to look at Pang Yulang's work that way. I try to think of her as a modern um, artist. Um, and I think she shared a lot of commonality with her predecessor. Um, some of them are not actually very often mentioned. Um, when I look at her work sometimes, I think of the works of um, Mary Cassatt or Berth Marisot. They were also modern painters who were very keen observer of modern life. Um, painted modern life, modern people, particularly um, the social and private lives of um, modern women um, in their daily living. They were having tea or whether they were reading. And I think Pang Yulang respond to um, some of those ideas of those artists as well. Uh, well, East and West, these are sort of um, it can be useful frameworks to talk about certain things, but they are also very just convenient baskets that we throw everything in. And uh, it can be really crude general, generalization. Um, when I look at Pan Yuliang's early works, especially when she first returned from Europe to Shanghai, and there's a moment that she painted herself and dressed in uh, Western costumes, um, uh, Italian and French, and, and sometimes in male costume, um, costumes. And she that period, she was a very conscious of her identity, uh, of um, a modern woman painter returning from Europe. And uh, uh, she does xi hua, you know, Western painting. Um, but 
but this is also the moment I feel her、um, works. She was not sure about her works, and she was still struggling. And this kind of、uh, self-struggling, and sureness, and um, um, it, it, it has this contradictory um, um, quality to her early work,、um, and is a very interestingly. At the time, the the national、um, art journals、um, they promoted her heavily,、uh, photographing her in Western costumes and promoting her as a good example of the success of、uh, studying overseas、uh, program. So、um, the nation was very conscious about its own identity um, um, and becoming Chinese, becoming modern, and the Pan Yuliang was also very much aware of.、Um, Of promoting herself,、um, however,、um, as she went back to Paris for the second time, 1937, and there was this quick shift、um, of how she sees herself. She was wearing a chi pao,、um, the Chinese costumes, and、uh, especially in the older portraits she submitted to salon,、uh, and she was very consciously fashioning herself as this Chinese woman. And this is also the moment when her portraits. Have this another layer of unsureness. She, the edges were,、uh, the toughness in her look are、um, kind of disappearing. She appears more、uh, soft. I don't know if this is a sort of self-performance to the Western audience, or, or、um, she was still looking for herself. But、um, there is this struggling between of identity,、uh, returning to the Paris、um, uh, painting circle. However, all this conflict of the East and West is sort of melted away and is sort of replaced by this new hybrid of um, um, artistic language, especially the blending of ink and oil medium in her later life. And this is,、uh, I feel, her painting is more mature and she's more ass assured about herself. So.、Um, Um, what I want to say is, my this project is、um, in the process of this project. I constantly ground all my research in space, situate every、uh, step of founding in space, in time, and in concrete circumstances. And it's this really concrete、um, uh, situations, whether in China or in. In, in France, that gives a new light of who she is, and we can think beyond using these frameworks, but really beyond the frameworks and looking at how her、um, various shades of her life can inform, can in turn、um, inform us how do how we think of this transnationality in artists, and maybe we can redact our tools,、um, conceptual tools, to look at artist life. I don't know if Sandy, in your research on Pan Yuliang,、uh, I imagine it would have been quite different to the archival geography、uh, that Mia was engaging in to look at Pan Yuliang. And I think, depending on the different approach to research and and the different、uh, presentation of research, such as using the video essay or more traditional research paper,、um, it would paint a different、uh, picture of the artist. So, in in your research of、um, Pan Yuliang, how did To、uh, go about understanding her work, because Mia kind of went with her approach because she didn't have access to the work, so she had to think about how to use the archival materials to、uh, give a different、um, like shape to the artist. So、uh, yeah, I don't know how how did you find your research? Um, actually, um, like Mia has already mentioned, there are a lot of、um, accounts that really focus on her biography. So I thought I won't have to write that again. So I really look.、Um, In this piece of work, I've written about her, and、um, some of the other example actually、um, from advertising poster because the whole work is about、um, modernity and female identity. I really look at some of her um, paintings, um, a couple of the self portrait actually Mia just mentioned, but unfortunately they're not in this exhibition. So I I actually talk about how she fashioned herself. Um, not only through the costume she chose for her works, but through the way she presents herself、um, in terms of the brushstrokes, in terms of the composition, and I really look at her expressions because, like Celia said,、um, portraiture is about the essence of the self. So I think the facial expressions are really important, almost like a signature. 
of the, the, the persons. And I've also looked at some of her other works, like um, some of the nudes, and I looked at how she projects her sense of selves in some of those works as well, and how she's really a, quite a, a diverse artist in terms of her skills, um, in terms of the way she understands textures and, and colors. I really wanted to look at her as an artist, not a woman painter, not a female, artist but a very good modern artist so that's how I have um, looked at her work uh, speaking of face um, um, I, I always struggle to look at the faces that she painted and I also think there is also in terms of portraiture there is a shift from painting the face and the, the body toward later her life uh, focusing on um, uh, the naked body, and especially the body with face turned um, behind us. Uh, and there's, a, I don't know, maybe we can compare notes. Um, uh, in her later works, there is a lot of focus on um, this heavy bottom, as if the heavy bottom is the, the visual locus of a painting, and as if the, the whole expressions in the face has transformed into the expression of a, a, a a stout body um, with the, the twisting and turns of, of the bottom. I don't know if you have noticed that and from face to bottom. Well, the, um, there's been a lot of accounts also of how she used her own body or her she used herself as model. I, I don't know about that. I, I just think the way she depicts the female body, I think for one thing, um, quite obviously, is to challenge the idealized um, female body that's very slender, is hairless, is very perfect. But I also think um, the way she has rendered the body is very robust. Um, the bottom is very heavy. I think it's it has to do, something to do with her being a sculptor, I think. I, I think a very robust, heavy body, it's much more interesting as form for a painter. So that's how, how I've actually looked at the representation. And also the feet too. People have always commented on how mo quite a lot of her female figures have really big feet. And which is considered actually fairly unfeminine. But I think for, again, an artist who's also a sculptor, that's really interesting, I think, for her to play with as, you know, constructing forms. Because bodies, you know, different parts of the bodies are forms. So yeah, I think that's... I should have some thoughts about that back, that mm -hmm. constant back. I, I, actually, I, you know, I don't know. But I strongly feel that she was, as an art, as a student in Paris, she probably was exposed to a lot of the Rubens, and I think she was looking at a lot of uh, the neoclassical, like Angra, you know, like the, the 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 back, how how slender the back is, and um, I think there's certain I I feel there's actually certain neoclassical or even classical influence in a lot of the nudes. The nudes seems to be a very important issue as a you know in Western art, and I think uh, Penn is a student of Western art, and these things deeply influenced her when she was very young and go to Paris to to look at all these amazing grand things. I, I'm sure those things have strong impact on her, and you know, and as a foreign student, when you look at all this nudity. Um, I'm just, of course, I'm just imagining, but I also would use my own experience, like, you know, when I was younger, much younger, when I was like a teenager or as a kid, when I look at all this nudity, you keep wondering about this nudity, what are they form of, what are, what, what are, what it is, what is this all about? And I think there's a very um, aesthetic academic reason she depict nudes and try to incorporate it into her own work. Uh, the, this search of nudity, how does it work in a Chinese context or in a, uh, a, a Chinese brushwork and how it could become part of her uh, because she is she embodies both. She embodies both Western art and Chinese art. Uh, I, I actually personally, I'm quite reserved about she embody, embodying Chinese art because she's really a Western art painter. Yeah. So, but then there's some kind of calling also because, you know, he, her colleagues like Choi Beihong or people like that, you know, they were all doing both like Chinese art and brushwork. And so I, you that room that you curated is so amazing that you have all these 
uh, the dancers, uh, the nudity, the dance and everything. And it, to me, there are like all these possibilities. You know, you have the Petit Dechenek from Mene, you know, the big one with the same pose and, you know, very contemporary, you know, the lunch in the park painting. And then you have, um, I was like, just full of references. You have Titian, you have everybody, you know, every, yeah, everybody was dealing with the nude activity in the room, right? And so I feel that even the robusting and, you know, the, 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 ro the uh, Baroque times, the, the Dutch, the Flemish were very into robust people, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that's like not shining, a, sh not shying away from uh, doing a very, uh, a, a very blunt nudity of what, you know, the, not what nude painting or, or the form of nudes are about and how they uh how they interact with each other in a on a service you know on a on a on a on a plane um on a painting service i think that's that's very natural to consider i mean like in her it, it's almost like her her um her own research topic yes. so that for me that whole room for me is very much like oh that's her research topic you know like she she look at all these grand mm -hmm. things and how she's going to respond to it. Mm. Right, but in that way, do you see that she was actually borrowing from all these Western references? But do, do you see that she kind of distilled her own um, interpretation of these in her own way Oh, yeah, way definitely. Of, of, course, of course, that's the job. I mean, that's the whole job. You know, that's the whole job about, okay, I see this. Like, so you question how this has to do with you. You know, like as a painter, you look at it, it's like, okay, so what do I do? I, I look at that, I love them, and I, I love to do something about this, but who am I? What am I going to do with them? How am I going to do something that is relevant to me? And, or, you know, how, uh, how that's exactly what I was trying to say at the beginning, like how to find your aesthetic identity, you know, who you are in aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we keep painting these things. I'm like, okay, you know, what to do, how to do it. Um, and you have, you know, in your in internal dialogues with the masters and whoever you admire, and then you ask them questions and they kind of throw something back to you and you st try again and see what you come up with. Mm. So I think that fabulous room that you did there yes. is a, a fantastic display yeah. of, you know, searching. What am I doing with this nudity? What am I going to do with the one of the most, uh, one of the biggest uh, topic of Western art, you know? Um, uh, the, the, the new figures, right? So that, that has been going on for as long as it goes in, in Western art history. Yeah, um, I, I think there's a lot that probably you guys also want to keep uh, saying, but I think maybe if we uh, open the floor to audience questions, uh, you guys can also feed your responses to um, other things that the audience might be curious about. So would there be, I think we can take maybe like one or two. <laughs> yeah, one. <laughs> okay, would there be any questions in the audience? Yes. <laughs> um, can probably shout. And it's really more in response to Cecilia's point just then. Um, and I would be interested to hear what Sandy and Mia had to say to Cecilia's point that, mm -hmm. because I'm very actually uncomfortable with what you just said, because I, what stage there's a woman artist where you do not look at her and think about her through the lens of other artists, that she actually becomes an artist of her own, that she's not necessarily searching by looking at other artists, but searching, doing something else. So I actually want to throw that to Sandy and Mia. In your research, when you look at, I mean, how do you respond to Celia's point that Pan Yulian is constantly searching through these Western male masters all the time through her work? Um, actually, I I don't view the nudes that Celia talk about that way. Um, I was actually just about to add, if you look at some of those nudes, sometimes they're ma male nudes. And I think sometimes she probably asked them to pose in those very awkward poses. I think there are several in, in this exhibition. They're not very natural poses. For me, I think they have less to do with her respond to the past masters. Um, it has more to do with actually her interest in rendering the human body, the the way how she can actually think about them and um, represent them in different ways. Um, 
that I think maybe at the time only made sense to her, but as viewers, especially nowadays, they're actually very interesting. And I also want to add that um, the way she depicted the human body, sometimes in these very awkward pose, um, sometimes they sort of turn against you, you don't see their faces. I think it also has to do with what I said earlier about how she's a very acute um, observer of life because I think in her works um, there are one or two in this exhibition she painted um, subject matter that would be considered back then at least um, marginalized I think in this exhibition there's a close-up um, representation yeah. of an African man and that painting I find really very um, interesting and I think there's another one it's sort of like a group portrait of Caucasian and there's an I think an African male there as well that one if you go back to have a look she's done that one really sensitively um, on the African men yeah. on the jaw there's this line that really defines this profile so I think it's in sort of either doing the new in her unusual way or painting these neglected genre. I think she really shows herself to be an artist in her own right, instead of just constantly borrowing or responding to I, past masters. The thing is, I'm not saying that she's just borrowing from the masters. I totally agree with what you just said. That's exactly what I'm trying to say, because those are just nourishment. You know, so, you know, you as a painter, you look at these things not because you just want to copy them, but they these are what they what painting had done, you know, and then, of course, the, the, the result would be what you just said. That's that's the natural result of it, because, OK, they did this. So that's why. So how am I going to do something that that's mine? Right. So the, the awkward pose or, you know, most of the painters were like. Particularly, they share this uh, very traditional uh, education in uh, in Paris, right? So they are not uh, unfamiliar with the masters. So the masters are there for them, but not to copy from, but they become the nourishment to help them navigate who they are. And as a woman artist, what they would do with it. So that's actually no contradiction uh, to looking at the masters, I think, just as the as a person who practice. Um, actually, I was about to say something before Yiwang asked this question, but it probably can in um, dialogue with both of you, because you, you talk about the, the state of being uh, as a as a painter, you know, uh, creating this space and you, you get sucked into it and you literally a created imaginative space, and this is what a painter does. And it's quite moving to think Pan Yuliang in her later life. Um, her painting do not have fit into what <clears throat> Paris art market was in favor of. Basically, these paintings have no audience. Um, but she has continuously worked and creating this imaginative space until the very last moment of her life, because it's precisely this power of the space that she is in, she's uh, totally satisfied inside. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you can disagree me, and uh, many of you maybe disagree with me, when I look at um, the Song for Springs, Song for Springs, I think she's painting many versions for herself. And all these bodies, um, despite facial features differently or the age differently, they all have a very big bottom and has a certain particular feature in that bottom and I and the yeah. same kind of feet yeah. I think she's as she turned a uh, bigger yeah. um, in her later life and she was leave, leading a sort of life in solitude and she's yeah. painting her um, bodies over and over again however all this learning of western masters have been sort of naturalized into a kind of um, painter's instinct exactly um, and also looking at this long scroll yeah. Um, which with the Chinese inscription by mm -hmm. Wang Jiyuan. And for me, um, very clearly, this is a model on Botticelli's Primavera. Right. Uh, with the three graces yeah. in the middle, but they are all wearing Chinese costumes and doing these right. dances. Right. And then with the male figure on right. the side. But, you know, you cannot, but this is not like a really clunky imitation of a Primavera. Never. It's never. Um, it's in this... Um, um, boring sort of this um, um, Western, yeah. very classical motif, but also um, 
painted it in a very Chinese canonical form. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And I and it's a, it's a really touching when there was no art market and there's no response from the the art the Paris art circle and she was still continuously doing this. Oh yes. I think she found um, um, terrific satisfaction in this space she created herself. I think mm -hmm. that's definitely how painters are. I mean, like I I I. I think true painters are like that. We're in a very lonely business. We're in a very lonely business. No matter what, I keep doing my thing in my studio. I don't think I have that many audience either, you know, like in my case, because it's like, okay, it doesn't fit in a Hong Kong context, what I'm doing. It doesn't fit in a Hong Kong political situation or, but you know, uh, there's so many things about, you know, being Hong Kong Chinese in, in, in California at the time too, that I actually react to that myself. And there's so much, question in my mind who I am, what am I doing as a Hong Kong Chinese, my identity, et cetera, et cetera. But um, just going back to what you were saying, I think studio art is a very, very lonely art that, you know, we are, we, if you're sincere about it, it's really about keep doing something that you constantly searching for. And that, that is what gives you uh, agony and joy at the same time. And I totally agree with you with, uh, you know, if they were all herself, because again, it's a very normal thing. It's a very natural thing. It's, it's a very natural thing that you actually depict yourself uh, consciously or subconsciously. Like the first slide I show you, the he and I thing, that not female figure on the left side, that I think it was pretty much look like me, <laughs> my figure. Um, and I think it's one of those things that it just come to you. Uh, uh, as a painter, it's a very instinctive response. And later you becomes more and more uh, aware of it. And it becomes a much more uh, conscious choice of what you're painting. So I really don't see the contradictory of what we're talking about. I think we're all talking about the same thing. It's just a different stage, different decisions. And then, you know, what aesthetic choice are you, are you choosing to represent yourself or your work and how they should be done? Because if you practice the art, then you would consider far more than just all these concepts, ideas, theories, right? You're actually doing something. You're actually doing something visual. And that's flesh and blood. That's very important to me, at least. I mean, I feel for her that I know is the most important thing for her, how sexy the figures are. You know, the the, pe the three women looking out at the window, how the long stream of the body being so voluptuous at the same time, so uh, flowing. And of course, that's her. You know, that's all these things is her. There's not because she borrowed somebody in the art history, then it's not her. That's also part of her. And as a female artist, you naturally do some things that you feel relate to. So that's why I think it's not because you're female. I mean, like, that's why, you know, you, uh, uh, there, are, there are artists who are very, very strongly feeling the sexuality as a calling in the history of feminism art. And there are female artists who relate to themselves so much. And the art that they do actually embodied the female uh, sexuality of themselves. And a lot of times, yes, the body definitely herself. And I really don't think that uh, contradict each other about what I was trying to explain about, you know, uh, being a, a, a student of the Western art, because that's her roots. She's really a Western painter. Um, even though she, when she went back to uh, Paris, she was very conscious of her being a, a Chinese. I think that has something to do with survival as well. Yes, yes. Um, and when she was in China, she also being, you know, promoted as a Western painter, that has to do with survival national, as well. It's just naturally, that's how things are of who you are, where you're being placed and your dislocation of self, where you are, you know. Um, so I think it's just um, a wonderful path that, you know, in a show that it's just really, I think it shows a wonderful, wonderful path of what she gone through uh, in one way or another, but artistically, what she gone through as well. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Very elaborate response. So, 
I think uh, we're definitely out of time, and my colleague is looking very anxious. So thank you, you guys, for uh, sticking with the program, and I hope uh, this discussion has given you uh, new angles to view Pan Yuliang's art. And uh, our exhibition will be on view until January 6th, so uh, please do go check it out if you haven't, and do come again if you have. So thank you. Thank you.